you know, we deal with um, the COVID and then we are entering the last epidemic season also. Yeah, that's, um, you know, so they call it a double... Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Whammy kind of... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So these are the well, busy period for us for the year. Yeah. Once when the last season starts, it becomes really busy. Uh, as we used to say, Al- Aluta Continua <laughs> is struggling. It has to go on. It has to. It has you know, that's uh, what makes life uh, challenging yeah. and uh, Absolutely. at the same time. Absolutely. That's what makes life keep going. Yeah. Well done. A number of uh, our colleagues are joining shortly. Yeah. Uh, I just spoke with uh, uh, GD Dr. Idris. Okay. Uh, so he's going to share with us some of uh, the Lagos experience with uh, Ebola. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, we'll see how we can contrast that experience with uh, the current experience mm-hmm. uh, yeah. with COVID-19. Yeah. Okay, Prosade is joining us from NAVDAC. She's yeah. Uh, my my hope is that ultimately these conversations can somehow provide some aid to policy, you know, in terms of the formulation and in terms of the connection to um, stakeholders generally, the various players. Uh, part of what I find is that uh, there are many who, um, or many times when we don't get things right, it's because we're not speaking on the same plane. People are talking yeah. past each other. So a big part of the key is really how all the stakeholders get to um, uh, begin to speak the same language, stay on the same page and perhaps pressure whatever forces in the system prevents effectiveness so i'm really hopeful that that is i I think that is really correct Mm. because um there are a lot of good works going on in different parts but sometimes it's well coordinated and good collaborations between institutions and partners so that we can harness each other's um strong points and then, uh, it, actually, I saw a report yesterday on uh, channel television from the uh, Pharmacy Institute, I think it was in Abuja, uh, and it was uh, quite uh, painful to see that there's work, good work being done, but not getting the traction that it could gain because uh, somehow there's a disconnect. And these these are some of the issues that the kinds of conversations that we mm-hmm. we have could help to um, throw up. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, one of the points that I, I, I heard made repeatedly on that report was how the private sector, the uh, philanthropists, are not focused at all on advancing those. And that's you know, uh, an important point because some, sometimes they don't know what to do, quite frankly. Absolutely. They're not sure Absolutely. how to effectively right. channel what resources. So mm. it then gets political. Uh, central bank governor rounds up the banks and a few people and you get something that might not be completely uh, aligned to where it matters the most running. Absolutely. Whereas Absolutely. Uh, those kinds of resources could be more appropriately channeled. Yeah. I think that's so correct. Um, because of the role we play, we sometimes see some very good works going up mm. here, there, and everywhere. But then you seem these resources may not be put at the point that you really expect them to be. And then um, you don't get the full output or the full benefits of what you can get from the, some of the work that are going on in some institutions. So I think it's 
good narrative. Let all of us be on the table and begin to talk and um, begin to find partners we can collaborate with and build up ourselves and our country. Okay, let me welcome uh, uh, many who have joined us. Uh, and then uh, in a minute, we can formally, properly start. Let me welcome Professor Tomori. Uh, Professor Wale Tomori, welcome. Thank you very much, sir. It's a it's pleasure. A great, great pleasure to have you on this uh, conversation. It's my um, pleasure. And I'd like also to welcome Dr. Nguku as my namesake, Patrick. Um, welcome. Thank you, Prof. And um, I, uh, well, I've been chatting with Professor Kobeni for some time. Um, who else is behind us? Did you not talk? Is there already? Okay. Good afternoon, Prof. That's DG Navdak. Good DG afternoon. DG Navdak is, is here with us. Good afternoon, sir. Mm -hmm. Professor Ade. Um, Happy Sunday to everybody. Welcome. You know, I always envy the fact that you live in San Francisco and work in Abuja. <laughs> That is the San, San Francisco of my dream. <laughs> Good background, yes. <laughs> San Francisco in Abuja, yes. <laughs> you say we have a bridge like that in my village. Uh, Dr. Idris has joined us, and uh, Dr. Chikwe Hikwazu, I think, has joined us too. Good afternoon. Okay. So let's uh, formally start. Hi. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Okay, lovely. Um, I want to say a big thank you. So a uh, very uh, uh, distinguished panelists and uh, participants in this ongoing conversation. Um, just to uh, bring us all up to speed on what we're doing, why we're doing it. Uh, let me say a thing or two about this series and um, why we are hosting it. Uh, there are a number of us who are convinced that part of the challenge of claiming the promise of Nigeria is getting people to engage more and understand where their various co-players are coming from so that policy can be more effective. Uh, we also think that it is helpful to get the people who are the recipients of the outcome of policy to understand it. But primarily, the reason this series started was to get the next generation better prepared uh, with an understanding of the history of various sectors, various policy uh, issues that we have had to deal with in our country. Now, this is particularly important in my view, uh, because we began to find uh, one of the shocking, I have to be quite frank, one of the particularly shocking ones 
that led to this particular series was I was chatting with a, a young man of some accomplishment, you would think, reached a very senior level in banking, was setting out in enterprise, uh, was trying to invite me to uh, play a governance role on the board of uh, a company that he had founded. And I was generally, you know, talking with him about governance, the meaning of governance. And I mentioned the name. I said, you know, Dr. Michael Lomolayole. And he said, who is that? I thought, uh, he must be kidding. And I tried to explain to him. He was the first Nigerian CEO of Unilever in Nigeria. You know, went on and on. And this 40 something year old gentleman had never heard the name Omolayole. I was in absolute shock. And I thought, the future is in grave danger. If people who take leadership positions actually don't know where things are coming from. I was actually still reeling in that shock. And I will be careful here because I, it would, the person would be so obvious. But the uh, chief executive of some parastatal, uh, I, had, I was talking with him about a certain gentleman uh, um, we were trying to celebrate. And he also had never heard that man's name. And I said to him, this man was the first chairman of the board of your parastatal, a very big parastatal in the oil sector. He said, really? When I then said something, the man said, yes, I know that. But I didn't know he was the one. I've, ne I've never heard of him. I thought, OK, we, we've got uh, some problems we must fix. So we thought that if we took on sectors of our national life and really delve into the history, how did policy evolve? What went wrong? What was right that can be harnessed and uh, become part of how choice is made in the future that we may actually really make progress? So we started this series to facilitate that connect, that um, link to a season in our life when things went perhaps a little better than they are going today, and uh, to draw, get people to draw from it a spirit for doing things differently so that we could advance the common good of all. This is how this series started. Um, then we um, thought we should take on sectorally uh, um, setting key things. So what drives human progress the most? There's a big debate around which we have actually a CVL annual seminar this, this Friday. This Friday, we're bringing speakers from around the world to try and respond to the question, what drives human progress the most? Is it education and health or human capital, as we call it? Is it capital? Is it trade? Is it institutions? Is it infrastructure? Which should get the most priority? It's rhetorical in the sense because they're also important, uh, but some are more important in some ways. So we decided to look at the health sector a couple of months ago, uh, focusing primarily on the, if you will, initiative from Angus Deaton. Angus Deaton is a Princeton uh, University economist uh, who won the 2015 Nobel Prize in Economics and who wrote uh, that nice book, um, The Great Escape, Health, Wealth, and the Origins of Inequality. So we thought we should take on the healthcare series. Since we started health, I think we've had um, six former and incumbent ministers of health, leaders in the regulatory sector, like uh, Professor Mujiade Yede. We have had um, people from industry, uh, the pharmaceutical sector, Samu Wabungwa, and several others have been on these conversations. Now, today we want to focus on a really challenging uh, area because we're in the middle of a pandemic, which is infectious diseases. Uh, infectious diseases uh, generally cause panic and are very disruptive of economic development. 
uh, because when people are scared, they don't make the appropriate economic choices, right decisions. They don't want to take certain kinds of risks and so on and so forth. Um, so the particular areas of infectious diseases that we're hoping that we can focus on today are, of course, the challenge of the moment, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, Ebola. I mean, we got celebrated some for the work that was done around Ebola and how we uh, made effort to contain it. So we've got Dr. Jide Idris, who uh, was a true soldier in many ways uh, uh, during these periods, uh, both as a um, permanent secretary in the ministry at a point in time and as commissioner for health for a long time. Uh, was enormously influential in policy. So uh, we, we've got him. Then we've got Professor Savannah Sokuben from uh, Irua, the CMD there at Irua, which is the center uh, that we turn to when the um, challenges of uh, Lassa fever uh, uh, show up. Uh, but the man of the moment is Dr. Chikwe Hekwazu, who is um, at the charge of, as we see a second wave of um, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic uh, um, really uh, begin to hit us. So let us turn to him and start with him and see if he can give us an update on what the heart of the challenge is and the strategy that is being deployed and what have been the constraints to effectiveness with the strategy that is being deployed. Um, and I have to say that I come to this as a person who in the last three weeks has lost um, more than a dozen close friends uh, to this pandemic. So, Dr. Ewers. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. It's really an honor to be uh, on a panel moderated by yourself. I, I say that with a, a really a great sense of history, having read your work and your, your contribution to intellectualism in Nigeria from really my childhood. Uh, so to be on a panel with you in itself, is in itself such a, a credit to in the input you've had into the thinking process in our country, but also recognizing uh, all the other panelists. I, I won't go into details. They all know in how much high esteem I hold each of you individually. Uh, and probably that's why you're on this panel. Okay. Um, Take care. To, to set the scene a bit, um, Prof, I won't go into the details. You know what the numbers are. We present this every evening. Uh, we're well um, into the second wave uh, of this uh, epidemic in Nigeria. We are well aware of the constraints that we have, uh, the progress that we've made as a country and where we are at the moment. But I want to summarize in a way the, 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 three, um, the three kind of summary um, my impression of the outbreak so far and the government's response. So when I say government, I mean a little bit more holistically than NCDC. Um, I, I will assert that there are three things that have marked this response. One is a very high level of policy consistency from the top. So from the beginning, we, we understand the challenges of our country, the federal structure, Maybe we, sometimes we don't understand it enough, but to have uh, a collection of cross-ministerial leadership led by someone as high up as the Secretary to the Government of the Federation has given us an opportunity to have a group of people that make decisions, whether we like those decisions, whether they're always uh, popular or not, but a set of decisions that are not discredited by too many parts of uh, the country. Yes, we've had some parts of government challenge, some of those are different types, but to a large extent, we've had, um, 
a fair level of uh, policy consistency from the, the, the very top. The, the second bit is we've had a leadership engaged with uh, this threat like never before. And let me clarify that a bit. You know, for many years, in fact, for, since I came into office at NCDC, we've always tried to educate our leaders on the threat of infectious diseases. And it always seemed like a very hypothetical threat. You know, um, firstly, our work cannot be, it's very difficult to make, use our work for political uh, capital because when you succeed by preventing events, it's very difficult to show success. It's a bit like a fire in your house. We all, at least, we all try to pay for insurance policies, uh, for a fire, for whatever, but it's a, always a painful expense that we will always try to put off and hope that you know, this doesn't come to me. So very often when I try to, uh, uh, when we try to influence our leadership to invest in epidemic preparedness and response, it always felt like, listen, you know, this is not our portion and uh, let's concentrate on, on the big infrastructure projects uh, that produce visible uh, political capital to our leaders. So it was, it's still, even up till today, the impression is that this will come and go and we can get back to business as usual. I am not convinced that there's a fundamental change in thinking from this pandemic, even with all the uh, trouble it has caused, that we need to really change how we uh, understand the risks that uh, this pandemic uh, poses for us short and long term. Uh, the third aspect is really about um, what I call operational efficiency of delivery of whatever we're doing in Nigeria. Right? Um, anyone that has delivered on anything will recognize this, how hard it is to do whatever you are, even if it is cooking in a kitchen, not to talk about sustaining molecular laboratory diagnosis in a country as big as ours, keeping the supply chain going, the quality assurance, the reagents, the human resources motivated for now, a year, you know, so increasing operational delivery of whatever we're doing, and not to talk about something, something as complex as diagnosis and response, delivering oxygen, you know, all these things that are part of a response. And these are not one-offs, it's when you have to do it every night, and you know, whether it's Saturday or Sunday, I have to make sure everything I need to do is available. So that's kind of the three uh, underlying framework I'd like to address this with. But Prof, if you allow me one last minute to go back, uh, uh -huh. yeah. One, yeah, to go back to one of the biggest challenges. I, I know we don't like talking about challenges, but I think there's a societal challenge that we all have, and which is really why I really respect the work that you do, is that you know that word science. There's there's a very deep lack of understanding of what it means when it comes to medicine and health. So when we say that amlodipine is a treatment for high blood pressure or ceftriaxone is a treatment for meningitis, how did we come to that conclusion? So if people don't understand how treatments or vaccines are defined and how they are then asserted to be effective, then you find people coming up with um, all the insinuations that why are you not using the cure from Madagascar? Why are you not using chloroquine? Yeah, why are you not using vaccine? And that it works for me or it doesn't work for me or that my father used it. So we collectively need to really go back to understanding and implementing the fundamentals of science. Now, if you look at big uh, countries in the world, they all have big science institutions that work quietly in the background, producing the research, producing the human resources that then are deployed to emergencies when they're needed. We simply don't have that. We have started building up that at NCDC from a very low base. So when we have a new laboratory recruited, we don't really don't expect the person to have any understanding from our universities. Our assumption is that you're coming from a zero uh, knowledge base. And we have to start 
from the ABC of laboratory medicine to trade. And unfortunately, there's nothing we at NCDC can do about that. That is something that really has to be addressed at a much uh, lower base, but it cannot be addressed if it is not understood. So mm. I really think we have a crisis in our society, in science education. And, and to me, that is why there's a lot of resistance. You know, whenever we put out our numbers every evening, people will say NCDC is producing numbers, or oh, yeah. um, you know, all sorts of insinuations around the work that we do. And I really think that if we don't get the fundamentals right, it will affect, it will, it will affect uh, what NAFTAC is doing because people will not understand why a regulatory process we need three weeks to carry out or six months, depending on what it is. Uh, people will not be, find value in working with Professor Kobedi in Irua because you know, in any other country, Irua will be the most attractive uh, tertiary hospital to work in because of the opportunities for learning. But it is not at the moment. We don't celebrate our scientists. We don't celebrate our scientific institutions. And then at the end of the journey, you expect NCDC to perform miracles, or you expect people are asking, why are you not doing local vaccine manufacture? You know, if I say in this room what I may not say publicly, that we are years away from science, uh, ma vaccine manufacturing. It's an extremely complex process. Uh, so, you know, if you think about pharmaceutics altogether, from uh, normal tablets to whatever else, injection, you know, vaccines are the, at the extreme end of where expertise needed. But you can't say that in public in Nigeria, you'll be stoned because they say, you know, these guys are doing it, these guys are doing it, why are you not doing it? We are not because we haven't, over the past 60 years, Prof, invested in building the type of institutions we need. You have done that, you and your colleagues have addressed that in the business world with, uh, you know, you know the institutions you've been involved in created, in creating. But unfortunately, there's no private sector incentive to do the same type of work you've done at the Lagos uh, 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 business, business School, school. Uh, this associated uh, educational uh, opportunities in the areas of microbiology, in science, in, in the work that we need to develop our industry. So, Prof, I will pause there for now. I know you have others on the panel, but I hope I've set the scene a little bit. Yes, no, you come, come back several more meeting. times during the course of the conversation, and thank you for that. Um, I'm going to you know, giving that track, be bringing him, uh, Professor uh, Wale Tomori next. Uh, but just to make a point, uh, which, which is really why this series is important, to educate about history. It seems to me really frightening that people who are political leaders don't understand the effect of pandemics and viruses uh, because of how they have influenced human history. Uh, I like often to remind people that a true interpretation of history shows that Europe's conquest of the Americas was not a function of their firepower. It was a function of virus. And one of the best discussions of bees that I know of, Jared Diamonds, in uh, both the books, um, gems, guns, and steel, uh, for which you won the Pulitzer Prize, speaks to the fact that if you think that 200 people on a boat from Europe conquered the Aztec civilization of millions of people who were warrior people, then something is wrong with your ability to decipher. Because that even if they had the biggest guns in the world, 200 and something people on one boat, cannot conquer millions of people who are warriors. By the time they kill a couple of hundred, they would have overpowered them. The truth about Europe's conquest is that immunities had been developed. After some of these things, these viruses hit them in Europe, beginning from the fertile crescent, where the domestication of animals led to some of these. So when the Europeans got to the Americas and interacted with those people, 
the virus is wiped out more than 90% of the native population. This is really how the history of the world has been shaped. And so it's important that our understanding of infectious diseases take on that magnitude because it can be defining for our civilization, our being around, and so on and so forth. And um, fortunately, we have um, experts, uh, Professor Tomoris, uh, one of the leaders in these parts of the world, uh, and uh, in, in research, uh, uh, one of the virologists of note. Uh, perhaps, Professor Tomori, you can share with us what you think is the biggest challenge with uh, leadership catching up with the true threat, true nature of epidemics, pandemics that flow from how viruses can hit us? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tommy. And thank you for the group that I'm also talking with. Uh, I, I like you where you started with the issue of history. And I, I would like to make that uh, one of the things that sometimes when people of my generation speak where we speak, it's because we have history behind us. It's because we know that at a time when good governance was reigning in this country, talented people were able to make progress and do things for the good of the country. And therefore knowing that, you know, there are the resources, the human resources in Nigeria have even become better. I'm saying that, knowing what I'm saying, that my generation, I mean, the current generation is much smarter than my generation. And if the governance that we had at that time made us what we are, how good will it be if governments in Nigeria really makes things much, a little bit of even what we receive and it's being used by this generation. You can see where this country will be. And that's why sometimes when we speak with passion about why are we where we are, why are we not doing what we're doing, is because we knew we did it before because of good governance. But then all that changed because the, the environment has become toxic for even the best talents in the country to function. And so our talking is not because we're condemning the current generation. We are saying that a country has been has abandoned the, the, the good governance that made the situation possible for people like us to be where we are today. And so back to the question you're making, there are two, uh, two ways to look at it. First of all, the, the severity of the disease plays a very much, very much good, uh, an, an important role in how people view the, the disease. We've had Lassa with us for 50 years or more. And it comes and goes, it comes and goes. Uh, and the human memory is very short lived. Uh, you remember it in December, January, when oh, everybody's talking about Lassa fever. The rains come, sweet Lassa fever away, and everybody forgets about it, other problems come. When Ebola came, it was the master of all diseases, fighting the hell out of everybody. And government, everybody came out and did something about it. As soon as we, the villagers said we had overcome Ebola, we went back to what we were doing before. So that memory was, it didn't last. I often say that a lot of times we operate on lessons forgotten rather than lessons learned. On the other hand, I want to make is that we as scientists also have a little bit of role. We have not really come out openly. Uh, I mean, we, we, maybe we have not got the right language to let people know the relevance or our relevance to the needs of people. Take the issue of economics. Um, the usual thing you get when people go to ask for money for us, oh, what, what are you bringing back into it? But then it, it is for us as scientists to prove that, that it is not we're bringing back into it, it is what we will take away if the disease comes. All of the years, things you have built up, all you require is one disease to wipe all those things out. And if we make a message along that line, not the way of frightening people, but the reality of it, that all of the economic growth that you have, and see what is happening with COVID right now. The, the entire global economy is, is upside down because of one single virus. And everybody is reacting to that. The, the, the speed with which the vaccine was made was because of the impact of this on the global economy. Why have we not made vaccines for, for other diseases? Because their impact on the economy has not been that, that, that important. Which brings me to the fact that when scientists make, show the people how relevant they are to the day-to-day -day living of the people, then you, you become, the people will listen to you and others will listen to what you're saying. I often say one thing, let's look at the situation. 
if the uh, Pengason, the people who carry petrol all over your place, say they're going on strike today, wherever my head of state is, he's going to come out and answer them. Asu goes on strike for a whole year, and people are asking, are they still on strike? So it's a matter of how relevant you are to your society that determines how the society looks at what you're doing. And I think this is one of the ways I think we as scientists have probably not been good enough in making people realize the importance of what we're doing. And I think that may have affected some of the reaction of government to, to it. And again, the ephemeral issue of uh, epidemics, which is not something constant. This is one epidemic that has been with us for over a year now. I mean, it's not like Ebola came and went, or Lassa comes and goes. So th this is a consistent, persistent destruction of the economy. And therefore, people are reacting to it, and governments are reacting to it. And that's the way it is. But then we, we don't have to wait for this to occur. Uh, before we, we do something about it. I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much. I, I think that it's good to get a flavor in for the challenges of each of these uh, epidemics, if you, if you will. Um, I know that the, the one that we tend to ignore and comes, but it still shows up is cholera. We might not focus on it so much, but it's still a basic uh, uh, um, epidemic that we, we that, that's recurring around us, which we should have taken care of. But Lassa fever clearly is one that uh, we have uh, 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 learned to panic about and return to the way we used to be. And so let me invite Professor Kumbeni uh, to kind of um, help us speak to the challenge of Lassa fever and why we can't seem to get around to dealing um, more you know, definitively with this uh, challenge that's been with us for up to 50 years. Thank you, Prof. Um, I must also thank um, Dr. Chikwe and Prof. Tomori, who we call our father in infectious diseases. It's good and I'm honored to be on this same panel with everyone else. Um, first, I think um, on Lassa fever, like um, uh, Professor Tomori said, this has been this is a disease that has been with us for over 50 years. And some of the pioneering works that he did in the early years simply were not built upon. For us in Iraq, especially teaching hospital, what happened was that at 2008, we found out that this infection was very prevalent in human environs. So as an internal thing, we now set up the Institute for Last of Our Research and Control because we felt that until we act swiftly and until we act strongly against Last of Fever, it continued to, to take the lives of not only the people in the community, but even our, our healthcare workers. As at 2006, we were losing healthcare workers on a yearly basis to Lassa Fever until we set up the institution, and then we started to work with some of our partners, both within the country and outside, then we began to see that we could actually respond positively to Lassa fever. I must commend some of the works that we um, that were done for us with some of the partners that um, Professor Tomori introduced to us, including Christian Happy, and also um, Stefan Gonta of um, Benagnot Institute of Tropical Medicine. They helped us develop our laboratories before we now started to build upon what they had developed. And we tried to institutionalize and indigenize the um, laboratories that were set up here to ensure that our local staff could take charge of the laboratories. And we were gradually over the years able to achieve this. And then we built also on case management. So laboratory diagnosis, case management, and some of the very important pillars that are necessary for infectious disease control. And these pillars need to be strong. And so we began to develop with um, partners, both within the country and outside the country to develop these two pillars, laboratory diagnosis and case management. I must also thank the NCDC, particularly with the incoming of um, Dr. Chikwe. We began to receive support from the NCDC and from the federal government because he could clearly see the vision that was laid out for Lassa fever. And um, about two years ago, we now had the 50th anniversary of Lassa fever um, disease in Nigeria. And that was a turning point for us in Lassa fever. We began to do researches 
that we hope will finally culminate in vaccine development. So yes, as at this point in time, we are working with international bodies and with WHO to begin processes that will lead to development of, of Lassa fever vaccines. But then still there are the politics of um, infectious diseases and vaccine development. Because you are being aided from, um, ex from um, the external, they don't move as fast as you would like it. Because if we had to compare that to COVID, then you see that the vaccines for COVID are coming out so fast. But that of last side is going to probably take a few more years to come. But I know we are working at it. So what we have done in IRUA is built up capacity for laboratory diagnosis, for case management, and making these strong pillars that not only help us respond in case of Lassa, but we also help us respond in case of other infectious diseases. I can tell you authoritatively that for the 2014-2016 um, Ebola epidemic, we were able to deploy a mobile lab to Enugu and Portacot to contribute to laboratory diagnosis of Ebola. And after Nigeria had taken care of its own, we were able to deploy also to Sierra Leone to take care of um, last, um, Ebola diagnosis in Sierra Leone, where we did over 3,000 diagnoses. So we are building on the capacity that we have. But of course, we continue to need more support so that we can do more of what we are doing. And like I always say, COVID may seem to be doing so much havoc all over the world. And responses in Nigeria may have its issues. But I can tell you that with NCDC and the work that they had done prior to COVID coming in, that is why we can get some of the successes that we are getting now. They had the a field epidemiology um, program where they were able to train field epidemiologists for surveillance, for contact tracing. We're able to now begin to expand the laboratory network. Prior to um, um, recently, there were just three laboratories that were doing COVID analysis. But as of now, I know there are over 100 laboratories that can do um, COVID tests. I did expect with the magnitude of the epidemic that there will be issues. But I think we should keep addressing these issues. But importantly, like um, Dr. Chikwe has said, lessons must be learned now, so that we can fundamentally build up the structure to ensure that infectious disease does not catch us um, um, gaping anymore. It's important that we build up the structure. And if you ask me what's most important, I will think of the human capacity development. Once we develop the human capacity and we provide the infrastructure and the resources, then we can do as well as any other country in the world. And I really look forward to this. I think I'll probably stop at this point Thank for you. now. Thank you so very much. Uh, it's it's uh, wonderful that you could bring us up to speed uh, on uh, Lassa fever because, you know, uh, somehow, like uh, many things, some uh, infectious diseases tend to be country cousins. They don't have the kind of constituency that others have, which leads to a really important uh, uh, question. How we can build constituencies that support uh, uh, work for specific areas of challenge with infectious uh, diseases? If we, if we look at what has happened with COVID, we see that Dr. Anthony Fauci was an institution of his own because of the recognition of the value of that office through several presidencies in the United States of America. And they can you know, quarrel about what was done in this presidency versus the next presidency, but it was an institution and he was an institution within the institution. Um, maybe we can learn from what happened with Ebola, uh, how we could perhaps begin to construct constituencies uh, that can support uh, the strengthening of the base for uh, particular battles against viruses, different kinds, uh, by, by getting a sense from Dr. Jide Idris, uh, for what was key to what they did in Lagos and how that base that helped drive that could be strengthened in a way that we have a support network 
for Ebola, um, for uh, uh, um, Lassa fever, for COVID, and that these become strong institutional supports that carry on even if that epidemic or pandemic were to blow away, because we know that there is a possibility of a revisit. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, may I just pay my respect to the various panelists, especially my seniors, Prof. Prof. Tomori, uh, the DG Navdak, and my other colleagues, uh, Chiku and, all, and co. Um, well, my, it's interesting that uh, we're discussing this. I try to be very, very factual. I face facts. I see them as, as, I, as I see them. Going back to Ebola, I think a few lessons I learned while in office during the Ebola period and after is that the issue of leadership is key. And to me, that is one of the problems we have in our country here. Leadership. And the second one was that you cannot do all this because we don't have the, the whole, all the expertise we needed. There's need for collaboration and teamwork. And I'll give you an example for Ebola. Lagos State, well, I think we were lucky that I had uh, governors or I worked with governors who had uh, some passion for the health sector. And that's, the, that's one reason why if you are in government, if you cannot get the support of a principal, I don't think you can ever succeed in whatever you do. That's one thing I've learned. So I know that it, all the governors I worked with supported us, especially with the health sector. And I give an example. If you recollect over the years, well, Lagos State, in the last 20 years, we've had a series of what they call physical emergencies. Collapsed buildings, uh, fires, remember the air crashes? And of course, when Ebola came, I mean, the experience we had previously was that as a country, as a state with such a high population, we need to be ready for any emergencies. And what we were doing then, based on the support from the principal, was planning against this, setting up institutions, setting up structures, just in case you had an emergency. Because when we had that plane crash, we never experienced that kind of thing before. But again, that's how we started setting up some structures that like ambulance services, we had some system we, we built up. And that created an emergency response, I mean, it's response team, which actually committed in what we call, what we call it, LASEMA, Legal Systems Emergency Management Agency. And that's because there were plans we started out from. I remember heading a particular committee when we were preparing for it, getting different stakeholders together. Suppose we had an emergency, what would we do? What can you contribute? What can we contribute? That depends on the So when Ebola, when we had Ebola in West Africa, so we sat down and somebody asked, can you make a presentation? What do you have a, an epidemic like? What will you do? And that's how we go. So apart from your leadership structure and culture, you need to start building capacities and competencies. Then we realized that there are certain things we needed that we didn't have. Chikwe mentioned surveillance systems, you know, uh, all the other things, I mean, diagnostic capabilities. After Ebola, I mean, when Ebola struck, we realized that the only lab we were able to rely on there was the lab in Luth, headed by a professor, what's his name now? Before then, we used to send samples outside of this country. And yeah. they don't have the capability locally. Why can't you support those local capabilities? And that's how you supported that guy in Luth. You can imagine if you had to be sending samples abroad during a bullet, how many people would have died? Are, are you with me? So we had the fortune of other uh, support people, the uh, donor agencies who supported us. They came up with different expertise. And that's how putting up this as a team. But when we were able to stop it, we learned lessons that we still had a long way to go. We didn't have the correct infrastructure. Uh, prof, we didn't have the, I mean, human resources, we need to build capabilities. We had virologies, we, had, we, what, we never got them together. And if you recollect now, what we are using now in Legacy, what I love in Legacy is that biosecurity lab. It was after Ebola, we started working towards that. We started thinking of One Health Agenda, support we had the pandemic, all those things. So it's very key, you must have good leadership, like they say, in any country, in order to protect your protect your citizens, how to prevent diseases, protect them, detect disease, and respond when this is happening. 
So they have specific capabilities for all these things. And that's why as a state, as a nation, these are the things we needed to study. The last thing again, just like Prof said, and I think uh, Prof Sibano said, research, research. Um, there was a time we were making vaccines in this country. So what happened? I'm not too sure we were using people from outside to make vaccines. That's why we don't, we don't, we don't build on capabilities we've had before in the past. Luckily, I think we are learning now because to me, when COVID struck, I thought as a nation we were fully prepared, we were not prepared. But we responded quickly. And I think maybe going forward, we need to start looking at the gaps we have now and start building the capability to prevent that because whether you like it or not, something else will happen. Can I stop here? Thank you. Thank you much. Um, just to take that down, I, I often like to um, cite some lessons from a conference in Nairobi in 1985. Uh, about development, the conference sponsored by the Aga Khan Foundation. And it focused on what was referred to as a tripartite approach to development, which tries to bring together three sectors, the public sector, the private sector, and what was in those days called private development agencies, that is the social enterprise sector. Is it not profitable to find champions in each of these sectors for specific challenges that can become standing committees that mobilize the possibilities to try and build uh, uh, consistently for whatever eventualities will come out in those particular areas. Uh, because uh, as we can see, we get in a panic, we call the governor of Central Bank, he brings some private sector people, there's some social effect, and then there isn't, is it not possible to do constituency building literally uh, uh, in these uh, uh, sectors? And I, I'd like just any of the panelists who would like to speak to this. Uh, um, Professor Adeye, uh, uh, we'll recall for sure that in our last session, we tried to speak to the challenge of pharmaceutical uh, product development along the lines of how, you know, these champions can function without necessarily waiting for government policy alone to do things. Uh, any sense for how we can build these enduring constituencies? Perhaps uh, Dr. Chikwe can uh, speak to this, and perhaps uh, Madam DG, if you can uh, uh, speak to it also. What can we do to build uh, a natural you, uh, constituency prof. from thank these for three sectors this, uh, that can of, uh, be permanent experts, working groups uh, trying to advance position uh, so that they are strong enough that they points, can influence policy? And all of uh, us, uh, uh, you, you have in the last session. We are, I think we had a couple of last but one, we had a couple of former ministers of health. And part of what I was saying is can't you constitute a kind of fathers of the health sector who can walk up to any government at any point in time and say, this is the history. This is what we need to do for health in Nigeria. But taking that down to specific areas like Ebola, uh, uh, um, and um, Lassa fever and all of that. Okay, uh, yes. Prof. Do go ahead. Yes, go okay, thank you. Yes, yes. I've jotted down a few points uh, from the erudite uh, panelists before me, and I would like to just uh, thank all of them. Uh, whether we are getting uh, experts from private sector coming together. Uh, at a table uh, with the uh, public, the most important uh, question we need to ask is why am I here? Why am I in this group discussing with, you know, so, you know whoever? Uh, once we get that clear, uh, then it will be easier to know how to work towards the outcome, positive outcome. And uh, Professor Idris mentioned the leadership. Uh, Professor Tomori mentioned good governance and the uh, uh, historical facts. Um, Dr. Chikwe mentioned uh, 
uh, the fact that you know our capacity in terms of science education is weak, uh, but bringing people together, I would term it as roundtable of the concerned. We've got to bring the people that are concerned, not based on politics. If we continue to focus our roundtables on politics, we will never get to where we are going. But if we get the people that are supposed to be the professionals together, which is what uh, uh, Professor Otomi is referring to, uh, public, private coming together for the same cause. But everybody knowing, why am I here? Why am I in this group? Am I here for the betterment of the country or am I here for the betterment of my own self? So if we have that focus, it will help us uh, a great deal. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Kudweni uh, mentioned uh, or did, you know, talked about what they've been doing uh, at Irua, and uh, I really applaud what has happened in Irua. But a lot could, a lot more could happen. For example, if we bring people together in terms of if, you know to focus on Lassa fever, what is the cause of Lassa fever? Is it because of food uh, preservation, wrong way of preserving food? Uh, is it because of X, Y, Z? We have to bring everybody together at this round table of the concern. And it doesn't have to be just doctors. It doesn't have to be doctors and regulators. It, doesn't, it, it should include everybody in that chain that has something to do in terms of Lassa fever. Look at the way we uh, preserve our food. You see people putting uh, gari or cassava by the side of the road. And uh, rats will urinate on it or pee on it. And then our people will eat it. That is part of the reason why we have all these uh, infectious diseases that we have. But until we bring everybody together and say, okay, your part, what are we going to do? Your own part, what, what can you do? And the government has to provide that leadership. If the government doesn't see that it is supposed to be round table of the concern, not round table of the politician, then we're going to have a lot of problems uh, to solve. Thank you so much. Over. That's uh, the point I was trying to. Uh, uh, Dr. Chikwe, um, can you speak to this? I mean, you are in a very uh, critical position to see how constituencies matter in moving solutions forward. Um, how can we create constituencies? I mean, if you look at how influential the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation could be with policy in the United States of America and such a thing, uh, we know that there are going to be, that there are many uh, wealthy Nigerians who don't know how to achieve immortality. Um, you know, a process that draws them into strategic philanthropy in a way that they focus on something like an infectious disease um, and build this roundtable of the concern that becomes a standing pressure group, not only just bringing resources, but, but educating people. Because I find that education is such an important part of it educating policy makers, the people in the legislatures, in addition to uh, the general population on some of these infectious diseases. Prof, thank you very much. I'll, I'll say a few words and then I hope my colleagues will come in. I see uh, Patrick Nguku on the call as well. Um, the, the, you know, I think, Prof, to be honest, we have started uh, on a journey. The, the issue is how whether we have the perseverance to move from the sprint, which is what we now are, because we are faced with the challenge, to a marathon, which is what we really need, right? Right now, more than ever, I, you know, I have state governors calling me discussing uh, deep epidemiological uh, questions on, on, on this infection. Um, the CACOVID group, the combination of corporate private Nigeria that came together uh, to support the response and required some level of guidance and, and often asked 
the most, uh, you know, uh, questions you can't imagine. At some point, they were asking, should I import uh, tons of uh, chloroquine substance, substance for, for production? I, so I, by the time the science was not even clear. So sometimes it's also us guiding both our political leaders and our private sector leaders in these complex areas of science and saying, listen, this is actually a direction of travel. So we have to do this collectively. And I kind of hear your call to action uh, out of this. It's, it's really for us and some, of, some others outside of this call to really go beyond um, the, the, the opportunities that we have in panels like this, but to organize ourselves into a voice that can, can provide some consistent advice to influencers in our society, influencers politically, is influencers in the private sector to make the right decisions and right investments over time. And Prof, you will notice that, you know, you mentioned uh, the Gates Foundation. You know, the Gates Foundation and Bill Gates himself has had a huge influence on Nigeria's richest man, Aliko Dangote, in terms of how he has made significant investments through the Dangote Foundation in areas of primary healthcare and even in supporting this outbreak himself. So I can say he is an example of how he has realized that there's an opportunity for legacy uh, that you mentioned uh, post the incredible transformation he has driven in the private sector. So it is how do we shape this narrative that this is not only something you do out of charity or out of altruism, that it is something that you do firstly for your legacy. But secondly, if, if we contribute to developing a productive, economically productive society by preserving their health, e their health, each of those people are buyers and players in an economy in the sector that you want to drive. So I think we have to become smarter in the narratives that we put out there so that we are not only seen as recipients of aid, uh, we're not begging for peanuts. We're saying, listen, government invest in health security is not something you are doing out of charity. This is to, you know, Prof, think about in our lifetimes, what has, what has caused, what has caused uh, as much an economic impact as uh, this pandemic on our economy. I'm not talking about health in our lifetimes. And, and maybe yourself, you can, you might uh, make a judgment call on whether the civil war or the pandemic has had a bigger, bigger impact on the economy, but not like, very little else has. So in order to prevent that happening in the future, we have to make these investments now. And that is our narrative. And it can't be just something, you know, you're giving to NCDC or, uh, Naima or NAFDAQ, you know, just to keep them quiet and to go to the next budgetary cycle. That this is actually for our own self-preservation and to preserve any intentions of growth that we have as a country. That you are right in the examples that you gave. The, the emergence of the big economies in the world was linked and probably as much uh, a factor of their you know, success in eliminating some of the big health issues of their time, as it was about any entrepreneurship. But the story is never told that way. The story is told about uh, military domination and economic uh, transformation. And the impact on uh, the, the removing uh, the infectious disease threats and other health uh, factors are not told in when we tell the stories of how the big economies in the world have 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 have, have grown. So yeah. maybe Patrick, yeah. you want to add to that? Yeah, clearly. Yeah, and, and uh, Dr. Ngoko, you you come from the PDA sector, uh, uh, the a, a very important part of the uh, tripod. Uh, you know your reflections on how these collaborations can be built up uh, around infectious diseases. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to this very, very exciting uh, discussion. Uh, yes, um, I, I see the topic strategy for keeping Nigeria safe. 
uh, in the context of uh, what uh, DG Chiku has just uh, raised, how do we create these meaningful collaborations that 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 are that are adding value to national institutes? And I just wanted to start by uh, sort of giving a brief about what we do. Uh, I'm with the African Field Epidemiology Network. We are a network of uh, supporting field epidemiology capacity building in uh, most of the sub-Saharan African countries. We've been in existence for 16 years and we participated in major, uh, nearly all the major outbreaks, whether it's in uh, Ebola in Uganda or Rift Valley fever in East Africa or Ebola in West Africa uh, or monkeypox, we, we, we've been there, particularly promoting the the, 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 the approach of John Snow applied epidemiology, looking for uh, uh, evidence for action. And, and in that capacity, we've worked very closely with the ministries of health, with the national public health institutes. And I'm, I'm particularly privileged to have, uh, to, to have worked with Chikwe over the last uh, five years really on very practical aspects of infectious disease, disease control. So uh, I was just, as, as I prepared for this talk, I came across a very interesting uh, paper that uh, Chiku and colleagues published in, in the Nature, I think mid last year. And the reflection was on, um, on uh, what, how do we approach epidemic preparedness and response in the 21st century? And uh, they make a very good point about going back to the basics of field epidemiology, public health capacity building, but recognizing that the world has changed. We are in the, in the transition period. Yes, we are dealing with infectious diseases, but we're also dealing with an increasing burden of uh, uh, communicable diseases, the obesity, the cancers, the diabetes and other challenges. So how do we, yes, we are creating institutions, capacities, uh, skills for infectious diseases, but how do we take cognizance of the fact that we have dual epidemics, so to speak. And I think many of the things have been touched about uh, that, that Chico and colleagues, uh, and I would really invite uh, colleagues to look at that paper. It's, 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 well, it's, it's very well thought out in terms of what next? Uh, how do we deal with outbreaks in an era of misinformation, in an era that uh, 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 misinformation seems to move faster than true information. How do we take advantages of the uh, technological advances, artificial intelligence and machine learning and, 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 and the other social media platforms that, that have been shown to be effective? We, we saw papers from Korea and Singapore on contact tracing. So, so very good arguments about how do we take advantage of these new emerging platforms and technologies to deal with traditional challenges that, 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 that we've dealt with in infectious disease, but knowing that we are dealing with also uh, uh, an emerging uh, non-communicable disease uh, uh, burden. So uh, the, the, the other point I really want to in terms of thinking about the way forward. And I think the mandate and vision of NCDC really summarize it, summarizes it very well in terms of what are the things we should be paying attention to. And I look at the mandate of uh, uh, NCDC and other national public health institutes in terms of how do, we, how do we deal with infectious diseases as we build capacities that can deal with other public health needs. And there is the evidence-based practice. How do we deal with things from a science point of view? Uh, how do we make sure that we are truthful 
to the international health regulations and the other, uh, other, other international uh, uh, frameworks that are well thought out. Uh, a good example is the integrated disease surveillance. Over the last 20 or so years, and Professor Tomori will bear me witness, we've talked about IDSR, but nobody has ever invested in it as significantly as it happens, it happened post Ebola. We've talked about IHR core capacities, but post Ebola, there was an emergency on this, which, and, and, and then the other big thing that I know NCDC and other national public health institutes are, uh, talk about is really that one health approach using research and using uh, a skilled workforce. So how do we expand our work, workforce in terms of numbers, in terms of coverage, but also in terms of skills, attitude, and, 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 and that investigative and urgent way of uh, resolving public health, uh, public health uh, uh, issues. So I think I just want to start with that preamble and say that when we look at NCDC mandate, I think it gives us the answers to how to make Nigeria and Africa safe. Evidence-based approach, one health approach, uh, keeping to the international uh, frameworks on global health security, but also translating that from a global point to a national point to sub-national. How do we work with the states, with the LGS districts? to make sure that their, their core capacities are also improving as we improve at the national level. So I, I, I just had three, uh, three points that I thought I would bring up. So uh, outbreaks are disruptive, but they, they get the attention of the politicians and the resource, the people who control resource allocation. So how do we make sure that, and, and Chiku has really made a good, uh, a case on this, how do we make sure that the vertical investments made for COVID, for Ebola, uh, for, for, for monkeypox, benefit the horizontal things that will help us with uh, the things that we build when there are no outbreaks, the surveillance systems, the public health leaders and workforce and, 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 and the labs and the, that evidence-based uh, approach. So how do we use these opportunities to make sure that we are building quietly on the horizontal investments that have benefits, not only for infectious diseases, but for non-infectious diseases? Uh, how do we support NCDC? Uh, keep building this, the, 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 the real-time surveillance system, the SOMAS, uh, during COVID, but for use post-COVID, for potential use in diabetes, in cancers, and other things. So I think that's from a development point of view, from an, an, for, from a person working with NGO, how do we make that case and actually ensure that we realize it? So that's my really first point. Thinking about these opportunities brought by the disruptive element of outbreaks to make, uh, uh, to strengthen our horizontal uh, uh, investments. Well, uh, well, thank you so much for that, that very important input. It, it, you know, it's almost a segue into the point I was going to raise next. You know, uh, in, in a previous um, episode, if you want, of this series, we did focus on primary health care. Um, and uh, Professor Itayo Lambo, you know, dwelt very uh, uh, thoroughly on the subject. And one of the things that I kind of like have um, been trying to get a sense for is how much really can we help prevent some of the infectious diseases by just doing a lot better work with primary health care, I mean, especially the cholera of this world and the lassa fevers of this world. Perhaps Professor Tomori can help us here 
I mean, some of us grew up with the old traditions of uh, the wule wules and stuff like that. Um, a lot has been put into primary health care, but it doesn't seem to have managed to stay in, in, in the manner of speaking after all the work that Professor Liko Ransom Kuti did in that area. Um, how can we help the management of infectious diseases uh, uh, through engagement in, in primary health care? After that, I will turn to information and misinformation, which is so important, and how we manage information in these kinds of times. Uh, Professor Tomori, please. Okay. All right. I, I think uh, while we're still trying to get the tech connect to uh, Professor Tomori, uh, uh, that same question, I think uh, uh, Dr. Gide Idris uh, uh, is in a very good position to identify with uh, giving the state of things in Lagos, the ultimate metropolis uh, on the continent, and the fact that the way we live provide plenty of opportunity for the spread of communicable diseases. Uh, um, how does primary health care play in terms of what our possibilities are with containing infectious diseases? Well, thank you for asking that question. Uh, basically, it's just part of the health system. And uh, like people say, is the, the base of our system. I mean, the base, if you have a strong base, then you have a strong system. And the uh, primary healthcare system deals with the basic things. If you look at the word prevention per se, what does it, what does it entail? We have three levels, primary prevention, secondary prevention. I'm, I'm just looking back to school. What's primary prevention? It says a uh, specific, I mean, health promotion and specific protection. How do you promote the health of your people? We need to find out what are the causes of ill health in our society. And there are very many, what they call social uh, determinants of disease. Very many here. You have an environment, you have a water, you have the individual themselves, you have um, air with breathing, our behavior, health seeking behavior, so many things. These are basic things that do not require so much listening. And if people can just, that's what primary care deals with. Basic things. How do you wash your hands? How do you prevent diseases? There's so many things. How do you protect immunization? Basic things. Uh, fluidization of water. Keeping our env environment clean. So things like, take for example mosquitoes here. How do you prevent the mosquitoes from getting to us? Keep our environment clean. Wash our hands regularly. The same thing we are talking about all these diseases, whether it's Ebola, whether it's COVID, whether it's cholera, etc basic environmental sanitation, basic personal hygiene. How do you protect immunization? Let us clean the, I mean, these are basic basics. This is what primary healthcare is all about. So if you can invest in primary healthcare system at the grassroots, they say primary healthcare system is almost 70% of our health system here. If you can do the basic things, how do you behavior, health seeking behavior, what kind of food do we eat? Do we do exercises? No, so these are basic, basic things that people can do, people can learn. And these are inf information you can pass on to our people at the grassroots level. They how do you deal with the common diseases, falls, fractures, whatever it is? You know? Then the basic thing, if you can't handle those at the primary health care level, so if you can get a primary health care system organized, and it's not supposed to, I mean, the federal government can give that governance structure. But the real activity is at the, I mean, I mean, the local government levels, state levels. Develop that structure. Let everybody get involved. There are roles and responsibilities for everybody, every part of government, every uh, level of government. They have their various roles and government. So to me, all this is leads to leadership issues. 
As a leader, you must be able to, you must have a vision, you must be able to plan, you must be able to understand what is happening in your, in, in, in your environment, in your country, in your state, in your local government. You must know the people, you have to build the capacities required. You don't need all these high techs at the primary care level. Like somebody said again, this is information age. And then we're making things simpler for us. You know, how do you collect data? Let me give you an example. Now, the time we had, we had the, I mean, uh, a cholera outbreak somewhere, I mean, after I came there. What caused it? A, the dam in Ogun State was released. They released the water from the dam in Ogun State. Went to that community. We were getting information from that community about diarrhea, diarrhea diseases. How come? We sent people there. And what did we find? There was poor sewage system there. No water system, no, no water. Water was, um, water was using pool water, feces, etc. That's what caused the cholera outbreak there. And if we didn't have a support supply system that was tracking data occurrence of disease in that environment, we wouldn't have known in the ministry. When we saw that increase in occurrence, something was happening. Now we sent people there to go and investigate. That's what we discovered. And that's what we sent people there now, clean the water, clean them out to clean their water, get the water system there, and that's how we called it there. That's basic primary healthcare system. If not, you'd have killed so many people. You heard of stories of uh, the bachelor salad all over Lagos. These are simple, simple things, the hygiene, basic things. And it requires a government that is serious, that can provide the structure, that can provide the funding and build the capacity and competencies. Thank you. We have, uh, that we proposed during the middle, middle of the pandemic early last year uh, was, um, uh, uh, something we called neighbor caring for neighbor. It was a system where companies, wealthy communities located uh, near poorer communities uh, could be part of a system where they focus on what are the most important needs of the less well-off neighbors. Bearing in mind that ultimately we live in the same world. If diseases start from those communities, it will ultimately affect the companies and the richer neighborhoods. So why don't we draw resources that a major corporation or corporations in that area can pool resources, rich communities can bring in some of their expertise and all of that to provide primary health care, um, environment type stuff, vegetation and all of that in the poorer neighborhood so that uh, communities caring for as we call them, neighbors caring for neighbors, will just lead to more uh, flourishing uh, kinds of neighborhoods. And in that structure, we suggested that local governments should be integrated into, into these neighbor caring for neighbor uh, concepts uh, in terms of the structure of government. Um, as we went into this whole COVID thing, there was some sense that all the decisions had to be made in Abuja. And there were people in the lower levels who just completely ignored what Abuja was saying. I mean, I traveled to the East and people thought that wearing a mask was a joke. You know, that this thing doesn't kill people around here. It's people in Abuja and Lagos, it affects and, and, and stuff like that. How do we uh, partition responsibility along levels of government and communities working with governments to deal with these matters that are very fundamental to the well-being, almost existential, for all of these uh, players. Uh, I think that um, I would like, in fact, uh, uh, Dr. Chikwe Ekwazu to speak to that from the, the challenge against uh, NCDC is dealing with today, and perhaps uh, any of the other panelists to please uh, indicate to speak to that if they wish to. Th thank you, Prof. I think the, the first thing to say to that really is to recognize the structure of our governance and structure of our Nigerian society and government, right? Um, we live in a federal republic. Uh, what does that really mean? when we have an infectious disease outbreak. Um, the, the, there have been some academics that have tried to look at how different 
countries have managed to respond to this. And they have um, categorized countries globally into three. Uh, one that have achieved, uh, when I talk about achieve, is how do you, how do you, how, how have they achieved getting their populations to align with what is, what is, what needs to be done? So they've categorized countries into three. Countries with a, a large amount of control, right? Where um, through government forces, through the uh, instrumentality of the state, um, that has been achieved. A, a lot of the countries in, in Eastern Asia will fall into that category because of how strong the instruments of the states are. The second is countries that have done this by strong uh, building of consensus. So uh, in the kind of many of the countries in, in, in you know, the Scandinavian countries, in Canada to some extent, in uh, Germany to some extent, where there's a very strong social infrastructure um, through government, but there's a kind of strong level of trust between citizens and their state and their expectations. So, you know, when government says to people, listen, it's in our common best interest uh, to, to do one, two, three, four. The general attitude of countries is, uh, of citizens in those countries is to um, apply uh, uh, for, uh, to do that. And the third category is countries that I classified as chaotic, where I'm not sure that's the right term, but that's just the term these uh, authors use, where there's a very strong sense of liberal democracy, individual rights, and, um, and, and that then leads to uh, people, everyone defining to themselves how uh, to behave and whether to adhere to those concepts. Now, I think that's a broad oversimplification because if you think about the third category, uh, sometimes this is not just driven by uh, behavior or government, it's driven by simple economics. You know, if I, if I don't have food to eat, I, I will go out irrespective of what government says unless they lock me down uh, by force. So I, there's a lot of space in between, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that very often, you know, people think too much on the instruments that the federal government has. And yes, you, do say, you did say that th people think a lot of decisions are made at the federal government level. The reality is that the instruments of, for implementation had they lie in the federal government, they lie in the states and lower, apart from the military and the police to some extent. And even for the police that is debated extensively in our polity at the moment about state police and all of that. The, the rest, of the instruments of enforcement are uh, local governments in regulation of markets and things like that, states in regulation of schools and public places. So at our level, we, we cannot do much. So the most that, when I say we, I mean the broader federal government, the, you know, what has been done recently, a little bit out of frustration is the regulations that have just been produced. But the regulations still need enforcement and the enforcement lies with other uh, instruments of the state, uh, both at local and, and federal level. So the, the key thing is, uh, Prof, is in a way through this crisis, we have to work with the country we have, not the country we wished we had. Then through the crisis, we need to identify where we need to make certain changes if we then want to do more or less of one thing or the other. But, you know, there was a recent big event uh, publicized on national TV live um, with many prominent people in our society attending, uh, obviously not adhering to any of the uh, principles that we've spoken about. And this was transmitted live on TV. So my, my phone was ringing off, off, the, off the hook. Uh, Chico, what, look at what is happening. Tune to this channel. What is NCDC doing about it? Uh, can't you send people there? So I, I laughed, you know, what? send people there to do what? What do I, I show them my badge that this is NCDC where I've come to close the event. No, so, <laughs> so, so there's a lot of, we have to really think uh, when there's a public health event, is there a law that can be enacted? And what are the governance processes around that to ensure that it doesn't go to the extreme? 
And if that is done, how do we now use instruments of the state, not only to enforce measures, but also to support the public that for whom there are consequences. So in all those countries in Asia, where people hear there was an effective lockdown, there are two things that happened, but people only talk about one. They only talk about the lockdown. The second thing that happened that not many people talk about is that the state then distributed resources, food, medicines, cash to businesses to keep them afloat. Because you cannot lock down a part of a country and expect them to sustain themselves on air. So the, in, the idea of a lockdown is impossible without having the uh, infrastructure to uh, ameliorate some of the um, effects of that lockdown. So um, I think, again, just to summarize, we need to really understand how this our federal republic works or does not work, and therefore have expectations on what each part of that federal government can or cannot do within the limits of the constitution that we are living in with today. And if we want to change that, that then needs a popular uh, process to change parts of uh, the constitution or the laws to enable the things that we wish to happen should happen. But that's really how things are right now. We, we can only work within that specific context. This seems to be compounded some by the fact that there's a general perception, and there's some confusion to that, that health is in the residuary list. It is not concurrent, it is not exclusive, it is just in the residuary list. So everybody really uh, can engage constitutionally with uh, matters that are health related. Uh, it, it kind of almost reminds me of. Uh, I had a teacher back in the 70s called William Siffin. Bill Siffin had this development model he called the bazaar canteen model, where you literally progress from a bazaar towards a canteen structure of organization of, of society. But, but you see, even in the, in the bazaar model, that like in the Mami market uh, and all of that, there's still a Reg, a, a network of client patron webs that can be effective. Um, and, and my question is, in trying to communicate, and this is important, particularly where technology is today and how it's abused, Dr. Nguku made the point about this, uh, um, fake news, non-fake, because there are streams of information flowing into communities that says, ah, don't mind these people. It's, well, it's Abuja, it's Lagos that have this problem. Why are you wearing a mask? Um, is there a way, especially with local authorities, engaging these patron client networks? Who are the important people in these communities? Who people come to for all kinds of help? And kind of educating them and using them as influencers. Uh, just like you can use social media influencers to ensure their own safety. Because clearly, uh, I mean, I, 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 I know what NCDC people went through in uh, a Kogi stage, for example, which was disgraceful. Uh, so you, you've got, you know, patches of irresponsibility around the place. And, and you've got to look at what is helpful at those levels to use to educate and encourage people to behave appropriately. Um, so are there any thoughts about, and, and, and uh, Dr. Nguku, I think uh, your, your, your opinion here uh, will be helpful uh, about how you could engage this challenge of a bazaar model and still be effective in achieving something, even if it's a lower trust community versus a high trust Denmark. Hello? I'll Rob. start. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then um, uh, 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 DG and uh, Prof can continue. I think one of the okay. and lesson that we've learned, I think, is to engage this community communities before outbreaks. Build the trust, 
build the structures and work with the communities. And it helps both in terms of the public health interventions, but also dealing with the information. I think the other important point that uh, I want to raise and that, that NCDC was really, really proactive in is the creation of this risk communication that engages before the outbreak, during the outbreak, it's adaptive to what is coming and, and modifies the messages as, 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 as the outbreak evolves. But there are also important lessons that we've learned from successful, and Prof. Tomori could highlight on this, the use of traditional structures for the polio eradication. I mean, Nigeria and Africa is polio free, uh, partly because of engaging these structures. And these structures in the era of transition in the polio investments are being used for other vaccine preventable diseases and routine immunization and other interventions. So how do we think proactively about investments that have been made before and utilizing them for current needs? I think uh, over to Prof. Or uh, all right. Thanks, um, Prof. Femi and, and panelists. I was just going to say exactly what um, Patrick just said, which is using the local communities. There's been a lot of advantages from doing that. But like he also said, trust needs to be built. And that trust means that before you even have epidemics, before you have um, needs for them, that you build a relationship. And once that relationship is there, once there's a crisis, then it's easier to interact with them. The traditional um, um, institutions can be very trusting. Once there's a pre-existing um, relationship and that you can build upon, and I think that will be very instrumental in risk communication to the, um, to the villages and to the towns that are not so close to Lagos and Abuja. We could also use the um, religious um, organizations um, to reach out to people. Uh, I think the first thing is to get their buy-in into um, the science, and then they can be a very strong and powerful tool to reach the communities. But like I said, one very important thing is to build a relationship prior to crisis, prior to public health um, issues. And then once there are issues, then it just begins to flow naturally that they believe you and they're able to take um, some of the things that you're taking. I thought I should have emphasized on that. Uh, thank you. Could I come in? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, I got disconnected briefly, so I missed one or two things. But basically, I joined when uh, Patrick uh, was talking. Um, a good example for us was the boycott of polio vaccine in the north. Uh, mm. In the I think it was 2003, 2004. And it took almost a year to get them. And it, the, I was still working with WHO then. And when this issue came up, uh, we were talking at the regional office. And I was saying, this is a local Nigerian problem not one which you bring uh, uh, outsiders. But then nobody then listened to us. Then we brought the chief of the WHO from Europe and one from another place. But these are people who are accusing the white people of bringing something. And then you're bringing the white man to come and talk to them. And I thought that was most stupid. But we said it, but they didn't listen. One of the errors we made, I and mean, one of the, the only solution to it was then to get to the traditional rulers. I mean, we cannot generalize this for Nigeria because traditional rulers in the North are quite well respected. I can't say that for the South, but let's look at the, one of the traditional rulers in the North. If, if the Emir calls a meeting in the North, the governor will come. If the governor calls a meeting, only his party members will come. So you begin to see the difference between the people we are talking about. And the Emir has the power down to the world level, to the whoever is in charge. And so when he speaks, it's law. And therefore, they, they become so important that we need to get it. And it is not getting them when the crisis has arisen, as people have said. They should be involved from the beginning. Any plan we're making for their own good, because we're making the plan for them, not for ourselves. Then they should be involved from the beginning and so that they are participating in it and tell you what direction and what way to go about it. I mean, we come in with our theories and say this, like I told Professor Ija Lambo when this crisis happened, I said, so you are going there, what are you going to do? Who knows you there? 
They don't know you, but they, might, they know the world leader who is living with them on a daily basis. Those are the people we need to go and talk to. And I think so if we take advantage of all these traditional issues we have, we'll get much better. And, and then this whole thing, when you talk about one health concept, it's not just one health about professionals. Alone. It's one health, including the community, including everybody that's involved, because it is their life we're talking about. And you cannot be, as we say, you cannot shave my head in my absence. And that's what we're trying to do. Over. Well, th thank you so, so very much. And I, and I think this is so important. I was, you know, reflecting, um, you know, again, back in the 70s, I was a Pakistani uh, scholar called Hamza Alavi, who, who uh, wrote quite a bit about these patron client networks and how effective they can be. But uh, what partners could we find that would permanently help track these kinds of networks and deploy them when we need to build uh, this kind of trust communication to communities? Uh, uh, is, is, is this the kind of thing we should leave in the, in the, in the, on the stool of NCDC, clearly? in my opinion, perhaps they need partners, and how do we build these networks of partnerships of any outbreak? Dry run, deal is, you have such a crisis, the system is engaged. Um, let me just, I don't know, perhaps uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any, any of our panelists Prof, can speak to this. Uh, Prof, let me just contribute like to. Uh, a little yes, bit please. to what has been said. Uh, Yes. Am I being heard? Don't know. Yes, it's yes. Frozen. Go ahead. Hello. Okay. Yes, yes uh, Prof. Yes. Uh, do, uh, Dr. Chikwe mentioned something about the country we have, not country we wish we have. And if we build on that or look at this uh, networking from that perspective, I believe we will do very well. And uh, uh, Dr. Nguku, Professor Tom already mentioned this. Uh, in uh, the country we have is based on superstition and also very religious. And what I, in terms of building network, what comes to my mind is we need to gather our religious people together in one place, uh, the Muslims, Okay. I think we lost her. Seems like we have a, a break in transmission. <laughs> okay, the network. Uh, I think Prof. Zayde is yes, back. Yes, I'm back. All I was right. just saying yes. that uh, the country we have is a religious uh, country and uh, also a very superstitious country. So mm -hmm. looking at that, we will need to make sure that we engage our religious leaders, educating them about pandemic. Because if the pastor of a 2000 member church understands that COVID is real and be educated using layman's language in terms of what he or she can transmit to uh, the congregants, I think we will have more effectiveness. I was, uh, we were at VOM, myself and my husband, about, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago. And we were in church. We went to, to church with our friend. That Sunday, they were teaching uh, the people on, I think, one of these infectious diseases, trypanosomiasis or something like that. In the church, I'm a Baptist. There is a week. Uh, there is a freeze. <laughs> yeah. Again, sadly. On and off. Uh, maybe at this point, I can if say um, Q and A is up. So, any of our participants who'd like to ask a question can raise their hands. Um, indicate. 
Okay. If the hands are raised, then we can call on them. They, they can ask questions. We're moving towards the closing parts of our conversation. And so Q&A is up now. There's an indication we can. I've raised my hands. Yeah. Yes. Okay, <laughs> please go ahead. Thank you so much um, for this wonderful opportunity to participate in this uh, webinar of the value for leadership. And I must thank the organizers, especially Professor Pat Otomi and all the other key participants. I am Dr. Bello Abubakar Mohammed. I'm the president of the African Organization for Research and Training in Cancer. And I'm also a clinical and radiation oncologist at the National Hospital in Abuja here in Nigeria. Um, I have listened passionately from the beginning and I have seen, I have like the DG Nabdak has itemized a couple of the things that are mentioned. But the most important to me is tracing back the history and the value of leadership. Where did we get it all wrong? I recall growing up in the 60s and in the 70s, we used to have what we called the uh, health inspectors in our villages. Those health inspectors used to go from every, uh, into every nook and corner of our villages and our towns. And if you are building a structure which has no drainage, they will stop you and then there will be sanctions. All these are now history. And believe me, if we cannot look at our history to move forward, then we will never be able to achieve anything as far as infectious diseases are concerned. Having said this, coming back to the present day pandemic, I will want to ask, I know Chike, my friend, uh, who we always meet at the Ministry of Health for one reason or another, I know his frustrations. And I keep asking myself that the lockdown the first lockdown, when we had the highest number of uh, daily infection at 774, and we affected a lockdown. Today, we have figures as much as 1,600 per day. And we can't have a lockdown because of some economic reasons. I quite understand that, that people can't go about being locked when they can't eat that they can't have a daily meal. That being said, pandemic can consume anybody anywhere. And when government put policies and they are not adhered to, and there are no sanctions, then those laws become just a big joke. I will give you an example. Um, government said all level 12 and below officers should stay at home, but go around Abuja and Lagos and most of the centers. You will see that level 12 and below are the ones that are going to offices because they are covered under emergencies. You see some councils have no emergencies, not hospitals, have no emergencies, but they are pushing the young people in the name of, look, we pay your salary and they keep going and that will impact to the larger community. There must be sanctions, whether we are in a, a, in a democracy or because of economic reasons, sanctions must be met. If you don't sanction in a society like ours, there is just not likely going to be any impact. That is my contribution. My question, sir, is are we really really controlling this pandemic at this time. What should we do differently from the rest of the world? Nigeria is 200 million people. We are so different from the rest of Africa. We have a large number. We have seen countries that have very large number like ours, what they are doing. The second wave, and indeed the third wave, is not going to be easy for us with different variants coming out, you know, different variant of the viruses coming out day in, day out. 
we should be innovative enough to have solutions. We have all the brands and what it takes in this country to be able to move forward. But there must be sincerity of purpose. There must be um, policies, political will to be able to implement all the policies of government that have been done to stop this pandemic. I will stop here and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thank you so very much. And, and I would like uh, Dr. Chief to be getting ready for that. We'll take some more questions. In the meanwhile, while we are getting ready for the questions, we'll take a message from some of our sponsors and uh, return quickly. So please get the questions ready and we'll call on you. There's something every mother has. It's something like a sixth sense, like knowing exactly when her baby's in danger. It doesn't matter where she is or what she's doing. She carries her family in her heart always and knows when all is not well, even when it appears like she might be wrong. A mother's instincts are hardly ever wrong. And she trusts M and B paracetamol, the red one, to save the day. With fast-acting and effective M and B paracetamol tablet, the red one, and its pleasant-tasting pineapple flavor syrup, she sends aches and pains far away from her family. Because mothers who know trust May and Baker for its over 70 years of quality experience. If symptoms persist after two days, consult your doctor. M and B paracetamol. Pain can't stop you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I would like uh, any more hands raised to ask the questions so that our panelists will note and return with the answers. Um, my team will highlight a raised hand so the question can be asked. Okay, we've got one there. Yes, sir, please. Huh? Prof, Prof, I have uh, a contribution. Okay, on mute, please. On mute, and you can ask question, your question. I've unmuted. My name is Eric Bado, Prof. I don't know whether you're hearing me. I've unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yes. Thank you, Prof, for the opportunity. Uh, once again, to listen to this conversation. I am not a medical doctor. I'm a lawyer by training. I think that was a point that was made by Dr. Idris, which we should never be tired of uh, reiterating. And that is the issue of leadership. The issue of political leadership is key. How do we get the political leadership to, as it were, walk the talk? Listening, listening to uh, Dr. Chikwe and uh, Professor Bojisola, we can see their frustrations. How do we help them? Because it's one thing to have people who know what to do and get the political support to you know, achieve their, their goals. Now, the point that we, from what we can see, particularly with reference to the COVID-19, we can see the discordant tunes that is coming from the political leaders, where the country, where the government is telling the whole world, oh, COVID is not real, and he's getting away with it. And he has followers, and he's a governor of a state, and nothing is being done about that. We are in a country where the political leadership attitude is usually the knee-jerk reaction to issues of health and like other issues. How can we continue like that, like this in a country where we have over 200 million people? And that is why I would like us to embrace the suggestion that was made by Professor Moji Salah earlier, that we need to have a roundtable conference of the concerns. We have outstanding professionals in the health sectors. They must come together quickly. Those who have achieved, people like Professor Tuburi, and be able to put pressure to bear on those at the helm of affairs, to tell them that all is not well with our health sector. I think that is the way to go. It is not enough for them to sit back and say, we have made our contributions, then let them do what they like. We, will not, we cannot survive in the country like Nigeria in that way. Like they usually say, success without a successor is a failure. So they must come to the round table quickly 
I'll be able to make to Dome to come up with a plan. Can I ask you to draw from your own experience? You are a former speaker of the State House of Assembly. Um, how, yes. how do um, scientists engage political actors like in the State House uh, to, to build a constituency that, that can help drive things like this, you know, in your experience? Yes, I draw you from my own experience, Prof. I can recall that when I was a speaker of the House of Assembly, there was this uh, pressure group that was led by Professor Query then, the CMD of UBTH. They were, came up with an idea of how to tackle the issue of uh, death that are associated with uh, death by women. And they came up with a policy, as a private policy, and came to the House of Assembly with that policy. And we turned that policy into a legislation to ensure that we have records of deaths that occur during childbirths, how they are tackled, the responsibility of each and every player in the chain, the value chain, in the heads of value chain, to account for this type of thing and to ensure how to manage them and ensure that they do not happen again. And of course, the House of Assembly bought into the idea and we passed a law, which is there that takes care of such a situation. That is the sort of thing we expect that the professionals should do. If they can engage the National Assembly members with poli you know, policies, and you know, which will now be turned into legislation to address specific issues. But even at that, Prof, there is still the need to get the leadership to buy into it. The legislature can pass the law. If the executive, executive does not believe in it and does not buy into it, if we come to not. Thank you, that is my intervention, Prof. Thank, thank you very much. Prof, can I come? Yes, please. Yeah, well, just for that to what you have said. You see, we all assume that our leaders know what to do. That's the point, yes. What I assume. Come from is that there's a lot of ignorance in our system. The people, one thing, we need to pass information. The, the other side, the policy makers are also ignorant. And it's not left to us as whatever it is to change that perception. And it requires serious work. The people in the house of legislation, they don't know what they are. They are under different influences. People come in, they drag them left, right, center, left, center. It now takes people who are courageous enough to tell them what to do. And of course, whether they listen or not is another thing. You understand? I've had people in the university who do research work. I remember I made, I made a presentation in effect in 2018. And I said, OK, how do you relate with the state government here? Somebody said, well, we, don't, they don't, we don't know what they want. And I said that if you sit down there, you never know what they were, but they don't know what you are doing. So there must be some people, some institution to bridge that gap. And that's why I said, look, in Lagos, some of us were lucky. We had people who were ready to listen. And they will listen and they will do precisely what you wanted them to do. Yes, they have influence in left press that. We cannot assume that they know what they are doing. Thank you. Sorry. You are muted. Oh, OK. As I, as I, usually, when I write about the province of Nigeria, I often say that we assume that the people who do these quote unquote terrible things are doing it out of wickedness. 90% of the time, in my experience, they're doing it out of ignorance. They may want to be advancing some small private interest, but they really are not aware of the magnitude of the damage they are doing. And that's why we have a duty of educating. Because I, I, I think it makes a huge difference. And, and that's why the big question for me is, how do we build this constituency that can put pressure? This is why I said to the former health ministers, why don't you have a small committee? And if all of you get together and go and meet some new successor and say, this is not what we've been working on all these years, and this is not the way we think, you will be surprised at the impact because we assume the fellow there knows what he's doing. My experience is 90% of the time he doesn't, especially since politics has become the common denominator. You know, any other questions? Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Okay, can you hear me? 
Ah, uh, okay, yes. You I can hear you now. Before. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, yeah. So, so far, we've discussed, you know, collaboration between okay. concerned parties to work with the government. We've talked about shifting the mindsets of Nigerian philanthropists. But how do we open the door to involve smaller groups and allow continuous information flow so that working somewhere in Lagos or someone abroad who thinks this is a space where I can have impact. How do we have that information consistently pervaded into the community so that anyone can join in to bridge the gaps? Well, it's an important, a very important question from Claire. Claire is uh, my co-host, actually, uh, but she's uh, speaking from Philadelphia. Uh, and, and, and the big question is, how do we make this information available to all who can probably make a difference. In one of these episodes on healthcare, we focused on the diaspora and the impact. And we had several Nigerian doctors in the United States who joined that particular uh, episode. And, and many of them were very passionate about what they could do. And two of them were building hospitals actually in Nigeria. And, you know, it's a question of, how do we engage this very important uh, constituency with information about what can make a difference that they'd love to contribute to? Commercially or philanthropy uh, oriented ways or whatever. Uh, and so that's an important question. So as our time is about to run out, I'll go to the um, um, panelists to please respond to these questions. Uh, if they uh, have uh, a position on them, uh, of course, the questions deal with, uh, are we really controlling this pandemic? What's leadership doing? Uh, and um, um, the other, Dr. Idris actually already began to provide answer to the question from uh, Mr. Matthew Egbado. So, Dr. Chikwe, uh, are we really controlling this pandemic? Your colleague from National Hospital has raised a, a question. What should we be doing uh, differently? This is Nigeria with its peculiarities. This problem is coming with a huge population. What more do we need? Uh, you may be struggling with those that superintend the work of your agency. Uh, what kind of support do you need with innovative ideas and all of that to really make us get on top of this situation? So th thanks, Prof. You know, I'll come around that uh, in a, you know, in a, you remember when I started, I, I spoke about three broad areas and the last one really was operational efficiency and of our delivering of services. And I really think, you know, if you think about the history of Irua that my brother, uh, Silvano Sokobeni said when he was speaking, yeah, Irua was really a small, uh, you know, barely known hospital somewhere in the middle of Edo State. You know, now that, uh, you know, everyone refers to Irua, it, it, this did not happen overnight. This happened because certain people decided to take it on themselves to transform this place, set a new vision for themselves and go about implementing it. And when you do something like that, the likelihood is that in the first three, four, five years of implementation, absolutely nobody will notice. Absolutely. It will take, it takes some level of internal determination from a, a, on that small group of people to persevere and push it through. So my, my challenge to my brother at National Hospital, we, we all know about the vision of National Hospital where, when it was created. I'm not going to go into details. We also all will agree to a large extent that um, you know, it may not have completely fulfilled that mission, uh, but there is an opportunity in this crisis of setting, it, setting itself out from the rest. And for all of us, the same opportunity exists. Um, we will all have our political battles to fight. This is just the reality of our landscape in Nigeria. We all have to get better at negotiating those uh, uh, differences uh, 
my, my big brother, Dr. Idris, talked about the difference between the gap in communication between university lecturers and, and the state governments is the same. All of us think that the problem is on the other side. The, the thing is we must narrow this gap and learn how to influence change in national assembly with our political leaders. And, and it is hard, uh, but it is doable. And as much as one state going on into another kind of issue, you know, as, long, as much as one state uh, which I would measure, but which is obvious, has really been a challenge to the national response. I, I must say that 34, 35 of the states in Nigeria have actually uh, been very collaborative. I, I, can, I can count the number of intelligent discussions I've had with uh, uh, Professor Kowa in Delta State, Governor Baseki, uh, Mr. Governor in Lagos. Uh, you know, so many governors really have really aligned themselves to the science. So we must not be distracted by the you know, occasional um, colleagues that are not immediately uh, aligned with the national response. This is, will be the same in most groups, families, that there will always be a few outliers. But what we must do is continue working hard, not to be confrontational, but to convince them on the uh, path uh, that we, we have all uh, uh, chosen. And the, the last question, I think, um, uh, was asked by your co-host, uh, Prof, is how, how we can, uh, how people uh, outside can also influence uh, some of these uh, uh, things. Uh, you know, I think there's, you know, when people quarrel over space in Nigeria, uh, that we have so many problems to solve. So, uh, very often we focus on the biggest ones right up there, but there are many smaller bits that we can solve and by solving them, we get, we slowly can coalesce this into something that works. So really I will encourage her and others to pick on any of these and to work on them. Educate yourself on the child. If you think about oxygen, in, in, in December, we had an oxygen crisis in Lagos and Abuja. You know, oxygen, uh, it, it, this is not a hard problem. So, so someone can pick up an, an issue like this, work with the hospital, define the problems, bring people together around coming up with the solutions, solutions of which have existed for decades and support one center in saying, listen, in this center, we have together with the private sector group, NGO, whatever, enabled that hospital to have a consistent unbroken oxygen supply to one hospital, and there are millions of opportunities like that to um, uh, support. So I, I really encourage, encourage her and others to look around. There's so many problems for us to solve in Nigeria, but uh, we are often distracted by the big problems. You know, uh, the insecurity in, in Nigeria, the electricity, these are big problems. Maybe sometimes we at this level can't solve those, but let's address the ones that we can and there's so much uh, satisfaction that derives from uh, getting things to work uh, in our country, even if it's the small scale. Very much. I'll, I'll take a, to 30 seconds closing thoughts from uh, the panelists, if they wish to. Uh, let me ask uh, Professor Tomori if yes. any closing thoughts on this Thank you very whole much, conversation uh, and a way forward. Thank you very much, Professor Tomi. I, I think. Uh, one of the things for me, I see this COVID thing as a great opportunity. Uh, I've been, what I mean by great opportunity, for us and on the science side, researchers and all, uh, I've seen an opening, a change of attitude in some of our governors. In fact, many of our governors I had one or two occasions to be in one of their committees. And it is for us to see an opportunity when it is open, to be persistent in our work and going and talking with them you know, I said initially, sometimes we too don't even know how to make a message to them. We need to go back and learn how to get our messages properly. And now to see an opportunity now, this COVID is bringing out the best in our governors. And I think we should take advantage of that and move on. I, I just stop at that and there's more to discuss. Thank you so very much. Uh, Dr. Patrick Nguku, closing thoughts. Yeah, I think as we continue with the capacity building for epidemic preparedness and response, I think what 
what COVID has really taught us is we have to engage continuously with the communities at all levels. And we have to take advantage of existing structures, traditional religious, but also success stories, success stories from smallpox, success stories from polio, but also success stories from other sectors, political, uh, veterinarians, and uh, improvement in agriculture, and take advantage of it to deliver our, our health messages, but also to deliver uh, 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 to deliver to, to improve on the structures that we will need. I think that would be my closing remark. Thank you very much. Um, for some of the questions, I would like to reply in this way. Right. COVID will not be easy to deal with, but be rest assured that as a country, we are fighting it. There's no magic bullet. There are no easy answers or we have to keep to the signs which we are doing. And if we cons consistently do this, eventually we will win. So for those asking, are we winning um, with all that is happening? I think we are fighting it. I think there are no easy answers. There are a lot of um, um, good stories about it. Initially, there were issues with ventilators, but people are procuring more. There's issue, there, was, there were issues with oxygen. It's been answered in different ways. So I think there are um, things, positive things that are happening. It will not be easy, but if we consistently do what we are doing and tackle where there are issues, then we will eventually overcome. I think also it's a great opportunity, like uh, Professor Tomori said, and we should seize it. Then I think finally we must engage the politicians. We must engage them constructively. A couple of days ago, I called my governor just with a phone call that I don't have any more isolation center space. My place is occupied. And with both pressure, I said he was coming the next day. He sent his deputy and uh, he, they promised to do me a brand new isolation ward commencing by next week. So I think if we engage the politicians and they see our need and believe us, then they can positively impact on what we are doing. And I think that's the way to go. So I'm positive. Yes, COVID is um, a problem now, but we will overcome. We will. We will. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Idris. Well, my I'll mute. Please unmute. I think you are, you are muted. Sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Yes. I think as a country, we are moving in the right direction, maybe slow. However, I think it's a responsibility to build on whatever it is we started with. We built on Ebola, we are building on, we need to build on COVID because we don't know what next we'll do. All of us need to come together, whether you are policymakers, you are scientists, you are other people, you are ordinary people, people in diaspora, people living here. We have our serious work to do, and the pressure must be on us to apply the pressure on the policymakers, either by when we are choosing our leaders, we choose the right leaders, or we find a way to persuade them to do what we feel we should do. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Our time is up. We've got to go. I want to truly, truly appreciate all of our panelists. I want to uh, say that. Uh, this has been helpful in articulating a sense of what needs to be done. For me, the critical thing is recognizing that it's about citizenship. Every citizen has a role and a duty, and there are many parts that they can play in this. Uh, and if everybody does their part, we can overcome whatever challenges there are. And in the end, we'll be able to make a difference. It's all about the impact that each person's life can have on all of us. So I thank you all so very much and look forward to uh, a conversation uh, around these issues in the near future. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Prof. Thanks for the invitation. Great pleasure. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, Prof. Bye. Thank you indeed.
Thanks Live a lot. Thanks, huh? Thanks. Thanks. All right.